Ladies and gentlemen, friends and fellow travelers, a very warm welcome to our morning session about the Portable Museum uh, today. I'm very excited to welcome our guests, Rafael um, uh, Montañez Ortiz, Pedro Reyes, Peter Saville, and Caterina Sera, four artists who are going to speak today um, about the Portable Museum and about their practice, um, as well as also our uh, translator, Reza Petra, many thanks to her, who will interpret um, the speech of uh, Caterina Seda. I'd like to thank uh, Aurelia, uh, as well as Mark uh, and Annette, and also Silvia very much. Thank you all uh, for coming. This is not the first uh, museum panel um, we organize in uh, Basel and Miami. It's been a very, very long marathon of museum panels. Uh, many of them have been geographical, a museum in the Middle East, a museum in uh, uh, in Europe, the museum in Latin America, and so on and so on, the future of the museum in China. But we felt that for today, uh, it would be wonderful to actually bring this all back to the artists and think about artists' museums uh, and this idea also of the portable museum. The notion of the portable museum in its present form um, is very complex. I mean, it certainly has a lot to do with the 19th century excitement of photography, this idea of being able to have an archive of almost anything, um, which uh, raised question actually about the original and how um, at all documentation of, uh, uh, of works uh, should be displayed in museum. To quote André Malraux, the author of uh, Le Musée Imaginaire, the history of art for the last hundred years is the history of what can be photographed. In the Museum Without Walls in 47, Malraux developed the concept of portable museums by the means of reproduction. Uh, also largely utopian, this book remains relevant for the discussion of or any discussion of um, portable museums. And then obviously many, many artists in their practice worked on portable museums. We think about Duchamp's Breton Valleys from 38 to 42, which contained reproductions of his works. Uh, the idea of the suitcase museum, maybe the idea also that we can have the work anywhere and carry a life's work anywhere, carry the findings anywhere. Marcel Brotas developed his own Musée d'Art Moderne Département des Aigles, which consisted in a museum without permanent location or collection in various locations between 68 uh, and 71. We have another example, the legitimate gallery of Robert Filiou, which contained objects and reproductions of works from different artists, uh, and again had a lot to do with uh, Robert Filiou's uh, travels. Filiou then later on even defined a portable museum in his head, which has always been one of my kind of favorite uh, museums. Then obviously the notion of the portable museum uh, became relevant again from a different angle with uh, technological developments such as the internet, virtual reality, GPS, wireless communication, smartphones. Um, uh, for example, if we think about the recent practice of David Hockney, who sends very, very regularly uh, images uh, on the iPhone. So that's almost like making the iPhone into uh, <coughs> uh, a portable museum. In my own curatorial practice, uh, portable museums played a big role. I founded the Nano Museum in the early 90s. Um, which was a, a museum two or three inches in a frame by Hans-Peter Feldmann, uh, where which one could carry anywhere. The museum then tragically died because Douglas Gordon lost it in a pub in Glasgow. <laughs> uh, so that's the idea of the death of the museum. Uh, there was also the portable museum Robert Walser, which was a vitrine. In, uh, we found it in the early 90s and started with a show of Dominique gonzalez Ferster. Uh, when Robert Walser, who always went on his walks in the restaurant, where he, where he passed on his walks, we installed a a little uh, vitrine, and the notion of the Portable Museum also played a very important role in the practice of museum in progress, uh, which, uh, for which I've curated throughout the 90s. And I'd actually like to dedicate this panel today to the memory of the great Joseph Artner, the visionary founder of Museum in Progress, who died tragically earlier this year, and who really from the very early 90s onwards had this idea of how uh, uh, a museum in progress, how he called it, in a kind of Alexander Donner sense, could be portable. It's interesting also that preparing this panel, I've received many, many emails from actually artists all over the world informing me that they are working on portable museums, uh, uh, such as Stefan Banz, for example, a Swiss artist, is working on a mobile Kunsthalle uh, Marcel Duchamp in the size of a post box, uh, which is starting in May 2010. So it seems to be definitely uh, what we could call an uh, urgent topic. But that's enough, I think, in terms of uh, introduction. And I'm very happy now to introduce our first uh, speaker, Rafael Montanis Ortiz. Um, it's a dream come true that uh, Rafael can be with us here today. And it's got a lot to do with conversations we've had preparing this panel with Pedro Reyes. Um, uh, Pedro uh, uh, has uh, been very inspired by Rafael's work for many decades. Uh, Rafael is his hero. Uh, and when we started to discuss the idea of the Portable Museum, 
He emphasized the importance of Raphael's practice in relation to this topic ever since the late 60s. Now, um, the CV of Raphael is too long to read here. It's about 40 pages. So we'd have a real marathon. I'll just say a few you know, key dates. His seminal contribution is to film ever since the 50s. Uh, even if he's more known for his um, groundbreaking destructionist performances and assemblages, obviously in Europe, uh, particularly also through uh, the participation in Gustav Metzger's Destruction Art Symposium and also uh, Christine Stiles who wrote a lot uh, in her text Years of the Warrior about this whole destructionist practice. But there are also the films uh, ever since 58, visionary films such as uh, Cowboy Indian film on Newsreel who kind of at the same time really um, as uh, other artists such as Bruce Connor uh, in a visionary way uh, invented forms of re-editing. Uh, what Raphael told us yesterday is that he's actually been uh, very close to, uh, to Dada and had been in contact with the Dadaists, so we can also uh, connect it uh, to that. I'd just like to finish the introduction here by actually reading a quote um, uh, which, I, which I love, which is in a conversation which Stock uh, Scott McDonald wrote up. Where actually, Raphael says, I would chop the films up uh, with the tomahawk and put them into the medicine bag. I would shake it and shake it, and for me, the bag would become a rattle, and I would chant. A very warm welcome to Raphael. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay, that's better. There we go. Okay, yes. Welcome, and uh, thank you for being here. And uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, where to start? I can start in 1969 with museums. Uh, I was teaching at a, uh, an art high school at the time. I've, I've since then graduated. I'm now a university professor, but I started out in the public school system. Fantastic place to start. Uh, teaching elementary school children art was for me a kind of interesting uh, sort of realization of culture and its roots and how it expresses itself in different groups. Uh, children uh, certainly are an important group within art. But um, the important thing was I was called to the principal's office and I thought, you know, what did I do wrong? And uh, what child did I insult? And he said, the Puerto Rican community is asking for a culture project. Uh, it was the time when uh, community education center money was being funneled into communities that were, in a sense, what at the time called underclass, disenfranchised. And uh, what do you imagine might serve that? So I thought about it and I said, uh, of course, a museum. And the museum would be long lasting. It would have much more integrity and give more integrity to the culture of the Puerto Rican community. And I wrote up this very complicated, very complicated, uh, far reaching uh, plan. Slowly realized that first began in a sort of classroom at the district superintendent's office. And uh, it's now 40 years later. And the museum has uh, pro progressed, it's international, it's blossomed. And there have been a number of uh, processes that it went through, and uh, in a sense releasing itself from the more ethnocentric, which came out of not the conceptual framework that I created, but out of the narrowest sense, I call it the agrophobic sense of culture where the uh, community wants to hold on to it out of the rejection, perhaps, and disenfranchisement of the larger world of culture. So I, I was very clear on the giving integrity to the culture of the community and it having to extend out into the larger world of the Latino culture, Puerto Rican extending to Latino larger culture, and then into the world of art and culture, which it's, it's done under the directorship especially under Julian Zugaza Goetia and his staff. Uh, while I was going back now to 69, while I was sort of organizing the museum, doing research all over the place, because I wanted to combine the Museum of Natural History, a museum, like if we think of New York, the Museum of Natural History, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the MoMA and the Whitney. For me, to pull all those together conceptually 
and have it serve the Puerto Rican community and then, of course, extend into the larger Latino community and into the world. For me, that's, that's where it was at. I got a call from the Museum of Natural History. They wanted me to organize an exhibition for them that spoke to my concept of the museum and the culture of the Puerto Rican in the barrio. I then had to sort of work out this notion of we don't have those kind of funds to organize all of the artists' artworks and have all of that material travel from place to place. They wanted an exhibit to begin at the Museum of Natural History and then travel to other museums of natural history and other cultural institutions around the country. So I immediately said, well, uh, I had, as a performance artist, I had used media. I had used slides. I had used uh, all sorts of sound. And I thought, well, that would serve it. Uh, the museo then can, in a sense, operate as within a satellite structure, that it can have a permanent base and then have uh, organized through media uh, the documenting of all the artists' works. This is back in 69 documenting all of the artist's work, all of the uh, cultural expression of the Puerto Rican into a package that could then travel, that could be set up with the uh, slide projectors and there are uh, ways of programming slides and multiple screens and sequential shooting, panoramic, et cetera. And so I hired uh, some Puerto Rican photographers, uh, some of, there was an agency with a number of Latinos that were involved that worked with the programming systems and so on, brought a team together and went around to the artist studios shooting their work, went around to uh, the barrio itself, into apartments, interviewing people about their cultural experience and expectations and so on. Uh, got all of that material together and there was the portable museum. And that was the satellite museum in the sense that was conceptually for me an interesting part of the museo and at a permanent site. The exhibition opened up and got lots of reviews. A lot of uh, middle class uh, Puerto Ricans were upset that there was such concentration on the culture of the barrio Puerto Rican. Uh, for them, that was uh, the less successful uh, expression of their notion of the Puerto Rican culture. But for me, uh, it was important because that was the culture that was being ignored, that was being disenfranchised and had lots of richness and integrity and deserved to become part of the mainstream and part of the incentive to move through that mainstream into the larger international world of art. Okay, uh, now, what about, that was then, this is today. Well, the portable museum is right here. Okay, everybody's got one? Hold it up. Hold it up. There's your portable museum. You're all directors of museums. You're curators. You have one of these. You decide what the exhibitions will be, what kind of panels and conferences will take place <coughs> here. And all we need to do then is find a place where all of us can register and we can all be in touch with each other and exhibit works to each other, exhibitions that we've organized, panels we've organized, discussion. We have the chat rooms, we have the cyberspace. We have all of these, whether it's Googles or Yahoos, we, we have the Wikipedias, they're all there in a sense to be connected to. Now the issue of course is always uh, property rights and plagiarisms and so on, but those need to be resolved. Let's assume those are all resolved. Okay, we don't have issues of plagiarism, we don't have issues of property rights, we don't have issues of uh, who we give fees to for what. Let's say uh, we all become members and somehow find a way to funnel that money back and forth. Okay, but there is your portable music. It uh, frankly doesn't make sense to have any other kind of museum. I mean, we could just put it in our pocket. How can it be, you know, more portable than that? And virtual reality. I mean, we might just plug in a pair of virtual goggles into this thing, and I'm having a virtual experience with works of art. And one of the interesting things about art itself is that it's beyond the object. 
I mean, anyone that's played any computer digital game with virtual reality context knows that it's all there. It's all there. I mean, most of us are still working in a handicraft sort of context. But certainly the technocraft is here. It's been here a while. And a lot of us still are caught up in the cult of the handicraft. Okay. I understand that. I myself certainly have spent enough years within the handicraft framework. The concerts uh, with pianos, uh, playing the piano with an axe, which is an interesting concert, by the way. Uh, I started using all sorts of digital technology to manipulate the sound and to project it to speaker systems. It's sort of like going from the folk culture guitar to the electronic guitar. Most of us as artists haven't made the transition yet then. Uh, we're still, in a sense, uh, shy about it, or is it real art? But this is the museum. It's right here. And that's where it belongs. The idea of shipping objects all over the place is silly. The idea of digging up archaeological objects and taking them from places where they are is silly. Okay. Virtual reality, it's a kind of consciousness. You need The idea of needing something concrete that you can see and touch is silly. You know, our minds have, in a sense, our, our cognitive processes have evolved beyond that. The technological reality of today, the cyberspace, is a consciousness. And a lot of us are distant from it. You want to call it technophobia. I think it's a kind of consciousness that we haven't made the leap into yet, where the virtual reality is the reality. We all dream four to six times a night. You wake up in the morning and say, my god, what a terrible dream I had. Oh, that was wonderful. I'd like to go back to sleep and experience it some more. Okay, and that's a reality. We don't question it four to six times a night. So we have the virtualness already as part of our process. And that's all I have to say right now. Thank you so much, uh, Rafael. Many thanks. I've got the great pleasure to now introduce our next speaker, Pedro Reyes. Um, an artist born and based in uh, Mexico City with a very, very long history with uh, Miami. Last year, we all saw his uh, wonderful exhibition at the Bass Museum. His work includes culture, drawing, architecture, video, group activities, books, and all kinds of other productions of um, uh, reality. Um, his exhibitions uh, include shows at the New Museum, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, Kunstwerke Berlin, Shanghai Biennial, the Seattle Art Museum, the Harvard University, and Pedro is working right now actually on a TV series, uh, something which started in uh, Yokohama uh, at the Triennale about uh, 18 months ago, and is now a full television series produced in Mexico and Japan about the life of uh, Karl Marx. Uh, but here for the Portable Museum, particularly relevant and urgent, is his uh, Portable Museum, the Atlas of Citizens Innovation, which is a cartography of cultural agents, social entrepreneurs, and activists from Mexico City. Um, it's somehow uh, a project which is uh, uh, done by Pedro, but I think also partially anonymous. We'll hear about that uh, more later. An inventory of solutions, a toolbox. Um, it's actually, in a very Duchampian way, a box. And as Pedro told me, it's uh, tens of thousands of boxes that will be distributed as posters among the public uh, school systems in uh, Mexico City. A very warm welcome to Pedro Reyes. Hi, hello, thank you uh, for the introduction. <coughs> uh, well, uh, living in Mexico City, uh, I, uh, last year I was approached by uh, uh, the, the committee that is organizing some of the events on occasion of the 200th anniversary of independence and 100th anniversary of revolution because they have, uh, you know, like they were inquiring me what kind of shows I thought was were needed to to be made. And they, they had a long agenda of shows that were related to history, so I told them that there was also needed to do, uh, to, ha to have a show about not where we came or who we were, uh, where we were, but where, in which direction we were moving or what was our um, idea of the future. 
<coughs> but when we talk about the future, often we have uh, optimist or pessimist scenarios uh, that are basically forecast of what can what may happen. Actually, the future is as broad as the present. So the best way to talk about the future is to acknowledge that the actions that and decisions that we make in the present, uh, it's it's what uh, they they determine what where we'll be in in, in few years from now. So. <coughs> I uh, I said, well, you know, like uh, if we're going to make an exhibition about the future, let's make an exhibition about those projects that are taking place right now that are deserve attention in terms of, uh, you know, like uh, that they can be driving forces of how we're going to transform our reality. So uh, the first idea was, uh, but you know, I was invited to, to somehow organize a massive show uh, to, to like to showcase all these solutions, and uh, and then <coughs> I thought that uh, there was a, a better alternative, which was uh, to make thousands of of small exhibitions, and and how how this would could be made, the uh, using a box that contains 100 posters, and these posters make up this. A, a portable exhibition. This is an idea I borrowed from some practices that uh, were done in the 60s and 70s in, in Mexico by Los Grupos, which were, you know, uh, a collective art, you know, collectives of artists, were uh, playing a little bit about the idea of the of muralism that the, uh, they 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 relied on then back then new technology of Xerox machines in order to do <coughs> drawings that were composed of many pages of Xerox and numbered uh, paper that you could assemble together as a puzzle and create a portable uh, a mural that was not only uh, portable but also multipliable that you could like uh, reproduce several times and install as a kind of wallpaper. So actually, these 100 posters that uh, compose this box become into a wall drawing. And if you look at closely at, at each of these posters, what you have is a, a diagram that explains how these initiatives work. These initiatives are somehow not necessarily uh, related to art, uh, although you know actually very few of them are, are culture related. They're basically groups or individuals that decided to take an existing problem in their community and solve it some way. Uh, I can tell you some few examples because I think it's necessary. Uh, let's say I, one of the uh, initiatives is uh, a woman who started making yoga in prisons and has teached 60 teachers inside jails that they practice uh, this uh, Ashtanga kind of yoga, and they uh, travel among different uh, jails. So she has created a whole education system inside jails. So these teachers now actually travel from one jail to the other, uh, creating groups and uh, in, in order to overcome the one of their major problems that is uh, drug addiction. And uh, and this is a uh, uh, or there is a, no a number of other projects. Some dealing with urban agriculture, some de dealing with uh, education, with health, with uh, indigenous communities, with creative industries. <coughs> so, what 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 this this cartography of solutions is is uh, like a, a like a, my wo work basically is make a selection of these uh, 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 ideas, these, these very practical ideas, and translate these into a graphic language that works as a codex. The codex and the, and the cartoon uh, the, the are, are close together because uh, cartoon stories and codexes were just forms of having small fragments of, of text that are connected through images. So. Once I had all these box ready, uh, you know, like a, as a project, I, I went back to the to the to the to the co uh, 
to the government and I showed them the idea. And they said, well, Jer we really like this, so, uh, but we need the, the, the kind of existing infrastructure in order for this to happen. So we'll use all uh, <coughs> educational system to, uh, so next year as part of the curricula uh, or the syllabum of, of the year, they have to install this show. And, and, and they say, well, well, how many schools there are? There are 30,000 schools. So we decided to make a print run of 50,000 boxes that will be uh, released next year. And this out of these 50,000, 30,000 schools will set up this portable exhibition that uh, uh, will be, you know, like a, uh, also have a mirror in the internet so you can upload photos of what has been your interpretation of this exhibition. Actually, <coughs> in the back of each poster, together with an interview, there's also a recipe. And this recipe, it's a, a, like a, like a, a, a every, every agent that, uh, you know, like I interview, every one of these initiatives has prepared a recipe that you have to, you can take some of the available elements or, 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 or wheels that are in the ca every particular context and create or reproduce some of these ideas. Let's say that if one of the uh, teams that, are, that is interviewed does uh, urban agriculture, maybe they have a very good recipe for preparing a compost box and then you have this recipe and then you somehow create this <coughs> exhibition that is a mix of a, of a science fair and an and a, and a, and a, and a art exhibition where you have all these experiments that you have to do and, uh, and then you can upload these photos into the, in, into the Web 2.0 uh, page. So this, 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 portos, this portable exhibition that is called Atlas de Innovación Ciudadana is basically focused on what, has, what efforts have been done with particular citizens that decided not to wait for things to be solved and decided to overcome you know, like to st pass on from complaint to to a, 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 to, a to a to this a form of action, and and uh, and 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 map them all into this uh, this uh, uh, portable atlas, no? This 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 cartography. So uh, uh, basically, basically, this is it. Yes. Thank you so much. Many thanks to Peter. I've got now the great pleasure to introduce um, our next speaker, Peter Saville. Born in 1955, he lives and works uh, in London. His interventions in mass culture have had a unique influence on our visual environment. He's the co-founder of the legendary independent label Factory Records. Um, he's done iconic covers for Joy Division, New Order. Um, his work has oscillated, one can say, for decades between art and design and has been celebrated in the Peter Saville Show at the Design Museum in London, I think in 2003 an exhibition which subsequently traveled uh, to Tokyo in Manchester. Ever since, Peter has also increasingly uh, developed a major presence in the art world. His first big museum show was the Contemporary Art Museum, the Migo Museum in 2005, um, as well as uh, uh, other gallery and uh, museum shows. And he's also a broadcaster and lectures uh, internationally. One thing I'd like to particularly also emphasize is in his involvement with the city of uh, Manchester. Uh, Peter is the uh, consultant and creative director to the Manchester City Council and that is really a very unique model. I think it doesn't exist anywhere else in Europe, not to my knowledge, and I also don't think in the United States where actually um, an artist becomes creative director of a city uh, and Peter has transformed Manchester completely and has uh, injected um, a Manchester International uh, Festival and we can even say that actually Manchester is somehow now his uh, social sculptor, sculpture. Uh, and it really is the fulfillment of what John Latham always had sort of had imagined as an utopia in the 60s with his artist uh, placement group. A very warm welcome to Peter Saville. Hi, um, um, thank you, Hans Ulrich. I, I wish I could say that I transformed Manchester. <laughs> um, it's definitely still a work in progress and, and will probably go on l long after my time. Um, I am. Um, I realize I'm still still learning, and from, from looking at art um, over the years, I, um, I feel that I began to, to, to learn to, to look 
so from um, to actually to, to to see a little bit more of the the world around me and to to kind of perceive things better um, and I very much have felt that if I was learning to look then other people were also learning to look and I'm think that I'm quite interested in the idea of uh, a, a learning audience. I, I think this is underestimated in, in many disciplines, the fact that, that the audience does actually begin, begin to learn and begin to see things and to understand things themselves. And um, over the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, I, I found myself um, collecting unusual <laughs> objects in places when I was traveling. Um, picking up strange pieces of kitsch, which themselves seem to be evolving. Um, this last 10 years, there even seems to be a, an era of, of post Coons kitsch, that actually kitsch now begins to, to, um, to uh, be uh, uh, responding to the, the art that has been made from it in earlier eras. Um, and also, I, I was just finding increasingly found objects and, and interesting things whilst I was traveling. Um, I sort of started taking photographs of, of, of these things, photographing things I was seeing in the street, learning to look out of the window, um, gathering up huge files of pictures that I didn't know what to do with. Um, in a show, the show that Hans mentioned in Zurich, I had a collection of pictures and just um, called it, it all looks like art to me now. And I, I found this um, a very liberating and um, um, kind of life-enhancing experience to, to realize that you, you could just begin to, um, to exist in the world and, and enjoy what you saw around you and, and learn from what you saw around you. Um, but increasingly, I was coming back from travels with, with extra suitcases full of things that I didn't really need um, and living with them in cardboard boxes at home. At the, um, the show in Zurich, I... I felt I had to show some of these objects which I'd been collecting for years, um, but I, I knew that they didn't, they didn't really belong in, in the art museum because they'd, they'd already been there. Um, artists for generations before me had, had, um, had worked with, with found objects and with kitsch items, and I, I knew that I was, not, um, I, I was not bringing anything new really to this experience. Um, so I just gathered some of the items together on a table um, next to another table with my notebooks um, as a kind of uh, work in process, um, not as a display, just as, a, in a way, a display of um, what I was thinking about. There, w there, was, one, um, there was one piece in particular, a, a, a plastic door chime, which I'd, I'd bought from a mail order catalog that I, I was particularly taken with. It was a, a, a most realistic, um, brightly colored bird that was a um, remote controlled door chime. And um, it was so fabulous that I, um, I asked the museum for a plinth for this. Um, um, I shouldn't really have done that because it wasn't really that interesting, but I liked it. So I asked for a plinth and they, they um, found a plinth somewhere. And, and in the process of, pl of putting this uh, door chime onto the plinth, um, I, I um, finally had an idea. I, I turned to Anna, my girlfriend, who was there helping me install the show, and, and I said, um, they, they, um, they need the plinth. Uh, and she said, how do you mean? I said, well, as you know, I, 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 my feeling is that if, if I can find interesting bits of kitchen places, then, then everybody else can as well, and, and, and I know that. Um, but obviously what they need is the plinth. They can find the object themselves, but they need something to, um, to look at it on, something to, in a way, formalize their, their judgment. So that was in 2005. Um, it took a couple of years, but finally I figured out how to, um, how to make a, a, a plinth or an attempt at, at a plinth for everyone. And it's here um, on stage with us. Um, I was very pleased that I managed to stick it together this morning without, without, um, without the aid of gallery assistance. Um, it is just a white cardboard um, plinth. It comes uh, flat pack. It comes in a cardboard wrapper like this um, and is remarkably cheap. We, we, did, um, we did a couple of hundred for a, a gallery show a year ago, I think. Um, and. Um, I wanted it to be very inexpensive. Um, 
I, I would like to see maybe uh, 200,000 or 2 million made, so it could be um, very cheap. And, and it's a strong, um, reliable plinth for everybody. Um, and we've put a bit of driftwood on it this morning. You must also mention that it was an unforgettable experience to attend the opening of this show of, um, uh, of Peter because there have been many artists who actually had uh, been invited by him to put an object on the plinth which constituted the exhibition. And also very impressive was that actually many visitors bought the plinth so you had us in the street people walking away with their plinth somehow. So many, many thanks to Peter. I've got the great pleasure now to introduce our next guest, uh, Katerina Seda. Born in 1977 in Brno, who lives and works in Brno, um, listen and in Prague. And uh, uh, after attending the School of Applied Arts in Brno, went on to the Academy of Fine Arts in Prague. Um, Katarina has done many, many exhibitions in all over Europe. Uh, also important shows in the US. In, a in 2008, the Renaissance Society uh, in Chicago. And besides her exhibitions, has done a very, very impressive number of books, which one could almost consider to be a portable museum, books as, uh, uh, as artworks, as Lawrence Wiener would say, books uh, furnish a room. Her projects include 2000, Homeless Man, 2001, A Window Exhibition, 2002, Quiet Please, I'm Painting, 2003, There Is Nothing There, 2004, Raising Children, 2005 to 7, It Doesn't Matter, 2006, The Granddaughter, 2007, For Every Dog a Different Master, 2008, Over and Over, 2009, The Geist von Uist, 2009 to 10, No Light, and 2010, From Morning Till Night. A very warm welcome to Katharina Seda. Okay. Thank you. A tak já budu mluvit česky z několika různých důvodů. Za prvé, že moje angličtina není úplně perfektní, i když anglicky mluvím. Taky proto, že jsem z Česka, můj jazyk je pro mou práci hrozně důležitý. A spousta lidí vůbec neví, že to je čeština. A taky proto, že naše země prošla, prošla v minulých 20 letech strašně, strašně problematickým obdobím a my jsme byli nuceni prvně mluvit rusky, potom německy, protože jsme neměli učitel angličtiny a teď musíme všichni mluvit zase anglicky. Takže máme pocit, že všechny jazyky jsou prostě důležitější než náš český jazyk. A to je prostě důvod, proč budeme mluvit česky. A naše země po roce 89 prošla velkým množstvím změn a prostě komunismus se přirodil v kapitalismus. Changes, many dramatical changes, and the communism uh, suddenly changed or turned into capitalism. Všichni mají pocit, že se vlastně 90% změnilo, ale já mám pocit, že vlastně 90% věcí zůstalo úplně stejných. Everybody is under the impression that 90% of things have changed, but I have the feeling that uh, 90% of, of things haven't changed. Například plot okolo naší země v podstatě zmizel a lidi mají pocit, že jsou svobodní a začali si ho lidi stavit mezi sebe. To znamená, že lidi mezi sebe staví tak vysoký ploty, že se vzájemně vůbec nevidí. Um, just to give you an example, the wall around my country um, has, um, has been damaged, but people suddenly started to build uh, walls in between their homes and their houses, so they can even see each other. Do galerie za komunismu chodili prostě buď jako oficiální umělci a ty, anebo tam nechodil prostě vůbec nikdo. A v tento čas vlastně jako v České republice chodí do galerie jenom umělci a kurátoři, kteří se vzájemně ujišťují, co to je umění. And at, at this time, at these days, uh, again, the only people that go to the galleries are the artists and gallery owners and curators who uh, make sure that they know what the art is and, and they discuss it just to assure themselves that they really know what, what the art and is and what the art is about. 
prostě není možný potkat tam lidi jako třeba v Tate Modern, jako v Londýně, jako obyčejný lidi, kteří jdou s dětma do galerie, tam v Čechách prostě nepotkáte. Uh, it's a totally impossible idea to, to see people, like for example in a Tate Gallery in London, where a family goes with their children to a gallery. It's, it's, it's totally um, unbelievable notion to see in Czech Republic. A já jsem prostě přesvědčená, že právě nejproblematičtější skupina, s kterou je potřeba pracovat, jsou tihle ty lidi, kteří by tam v životě nešli. Proto vlastně víc než deset let pracuju s lidmi, který to nezajímá, nebaví, nechtějí to dělat, ani by do galerie nešli. Zároveň jsem přesvědčena o tom, že právě t- ty, u, u těchto těch lidí je obrovský potenciál přijít na nějakou úplně novou formu, co to vlastně je, co to vlastně znamená. And that's why I've been trying to, to, to gather or grasp from, from these people what the art is, what it is, a kind of like a new uh, way of understanding art. A můj největší pro, jeden z největších projektů a prvních, který jsem dělala, byl v roce 2003. Projekt nic tam není. Um, one of my very first projects was in 2003, um, there is nothing. Uh, do kterého jsem zapojila všechny občany vesnice Ponětovice, 300 obyvatel. Uh, where I was working with uh, the entire village of, uh, of po- po- Ponětovice. Ponětovice and uh, I included the entire village to cooperate with me on this project. Bylo to proto, protože v naší země žijí skoro všichni obyvatelé se skepsí, že ve vesnicích se vůbec nic neodehrává, že tam prostě nic není. Uh, everybody believes, everybody in my country believes that um, the life in a village is about nothing. Nothing is going on, nobody is interested in anything, there is nothing to, to, to find. A já jsem chtěla vlastně ukázat, že lze něco uskutečnit, aniž by se tam přineslo cokoliv zvláštního do té vesnice a zároveň by se těm lidem ukázalo, že tam něco je důležitýho. And, and I, I wanted to show that there is something um, without bringing any significant um, Project, I just wanted to see and show that there really is something going on in a, in a small village. A všem 300 obyvatelům jsem rozdala dotazníky a ptala jsem se jich, co obvykle v sobotu dělají. A oni všichni napsali, a všichni napsali to tež, ale každý v jiný čas. Um, I gave the entire village, uh, it's about 300 people, a questionnaire, and I asked them the same question: What, what, do, do, what do you typically do? Um, the interesting thing was that they wrote the same things, but They were doing them in a different time. A já jsem na základě toho sestavila režim dne pro jednu sobotu a celý rok jsem všechny přemlouvala, aby ten režim dne dodrželi. Um, so I've decided to, to um, develop or create a routine for the village people and it took me almost a year to persuade, my, to persuade them to cooperate with me um, just to decide on one uh, Saturday to, to live according to one simple routine. Vlastně měli ráno všichni zaráv vstát, všichni měli jít do obchodu, všichni měli zametat, všichni měli mít stejný oběd a večer se měli sejít na pivu. For example, they, they were supposed to get up at the same time, uh, make breakfast, go shopping, um, uh, sw- 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 oběd. Uh, they even had the same thing, the same lunch. Uh, Uh, it was a tomato sauce and uh, they were supposed to sweep their garden, their yard and then meet uh, in a local pub. A v žádném případě tady u téhle věci neobstojíte s tím, že řeknete, že děláte nějaký umění. And just, for, just to give you an example, it's impossible to state that you are trying to create an art while Mus- doing this. Musíte s těmahle lidma přijít na úplně jiný důvod, proč tyhle věci dělají. You have to explain to them that a totally different reason rather than art why you are doing this. A musím říct, že ani po roce jsem nebyla schopná v podstatě s lidmi ten důvod najít. Protože lidem to přišla prostě komunistická hra. For them it was just a communist game. Ale důležitý, důležitá, důležitý rozdíl mezi mýma věcma je ten, že já se snažím lidi spojit na základě věcí, které je rozdělují. The, uh, what I'm trying to do is to bring people together based on things that make that are different among them. Obvykle se lidi spojují na základě společných koníčků nebo na základě nějakých věcí, které je spojují. Typically people gather together or get together based on things that they have in common. 
ale já je prostě spojuji na základě něčeho, co je zásadním způsobem rozděluje. But I'm trying to bring them together based on drastic differences between them. A jsem přesvědčena, že tímhle způsobem jsou schopni se sejít lidi, kteří by se nikdy nesetkali a kteří jsou se vzájemně úplně nesympatický. Because that makes me believe that under these circumstances people that would typically never get together have a, have a option or possibility to, to come together and work. Například jedna z mých prací, kterou jsem dělala, byla v roce 2008, která se jmenuje Over and Over. Uh, one of my other projects was in 2008, uh, uh, it was named Over and Over. Který vycházel právě z toho, že všechny ploty v naší zemi se začaly zvedat do výšky a když procházím naší obci, tak vlastně nejsem schopná vůbec nikoho vidět. Uh, it was based on, on, the, on the fact that the walls and fences in my village are getting higher and higher and when I'm driving through the village I'm not able to see anyone. A dal jsem si za úkol přijít na způsob, jak vlastně, když procházím tou vesnicí, můžu všechny ostatní uvidět, ale zároveň způsobit, aby se oni uviděli navzájem. And I was trying to uh, see people of the village and make it possible for the others to see themselves and each other. A návod mě poskytla taková situace dvou sousedů, kterým starý strom spadl na plot a ten plot jim vyvrátil a oni se vlastně u toho plotu sešli, aby, tu, aby ten strom vyprostili. And what started is was a little story of two neighbors whose uh, there was an old tree that fell and damaged the wall or the fence between them and they were standing there uh, by the by the damaged fence. A já jsem si vlastně uvědomila, že tak abych ty sousedy spojila, tak vlastně musím jejich plotem projít. And then that made me realize that in order for me to see the neighbors, I have to walk through their fences. Takže jsem spojila svůj dom a autobusovou zastávku na druhé straně vesnice a rozhodla se, že jeden den po té přímce projdu těch 80 plotů. So I've decided to uh, to to connect uh, the bus stop and my house and I've decided to walk one day through 80, through, uh, through those 80 fences. Ale abych prostě mohla si 80 protu projít, tak museli všichni sousedé z těch 80 pozemků souhlasit a museli přistavit k tomu plotu takovou věc, abych ten plot mohla překonat. But for me you know, for me to do that all 80 neighbors had to put something by the fence for me so that I was able to cross over through those 80 fences they had to put kind of like an obstacle or an object so that I was able to walk over takže aby kdyby jeden soused nepo, ne, nesouhlasil a nechtěl to dělat tak se to vlastně nepovede they, the, all 80 of them had to agree to that otherwise it wouldn't be possible if just only one person was against it I, it wouldn't be possible a zároveň jsem jak ještě tehdy chtěla abych mohla tu věc ukázat ještě na nějakým jiným místě než je pouze v, tém, v té vesnici. I was trying to, to show it somewhere else rather than in the village. A tady se dotýkáme něčeho, o čem mluvíme, jako že je uh, přenosné muzeum. And, and this is what we are trying to describe as a portable museum. Že jsem prostě chtěla určitou věc přenést, aby ty lidi dokázali uvidět. I was trying to uh, move something for the people to see. A v rámci berlínského bienále jsem byla vyzvaná k tomu, abych udělala nějakou instalaci. Uh, I was asked by the Berlin Biennale uh, to, to make a kind of an installation. A tak jsem se sbírala po té přímce 10 plotů a postavila jsem v Berlíně jejich kopie, které jsem spojila do, do jednoho kruhu. So I picked 10 of those uh, uh, of those examples from the from the village, from the neighbors and I made a copy of it at, in the Berlin Museum. A snažila jsem se 6 měsíců přemluvit všechny sousedy, zda by jeli uh, z České republiky do Berlína a přivezli sebou ty věci, s kterými by ty ploty překonali. So I took me almost six months to ask and persuade the uh, village people, the neighbors, to come with me to travel from Czech Republic to Berlin and bring exactly the same objects in order for us to build uh, the, uh, the same copy in Berlin. Což se ukázalo jako úplně nepřekonatelná překážka, protože všichni chtěli jet, ale ne se svým sousedem. The, the, the funny part was that everybody wanted to go, but not with their neighbor. So it was a huge obstacle. Což bylo prostě úplně šílený, já jsem nebyla ze 100 lidí schopná sehnat těch prostě 40 lidí. So it was absolutely crazy, I wasn't able to get 40 people out of 100 to go with me to Berlin. A vlastně to byla úplně stejná situace, kdyby jeden soused nejel, tak se to nepovede, protože ten druhý nemá ke komu přelézt. The, the most important part was that every neighbor had to come, because if the other neighbor wasn't able to come, then you wouldn't have anywhere to cross over to. A vlastně je to úplně, úplně nesmyslná představa, že jedete prostě stovky kilometrů, abyste tam u svého plotu potkal svého souseda. 
for them it was just a crazy idea to, to understand. They, they, they failed to understand why do I have to travel hundreds of kilometers just to meet my neighbor somewhere else. <laughs> Ale prostě stala se jakoby fatální věc, že prostě ty lidi stáli u svého plotu, jako který, úplně stejného plotu, jaký mají doma, a říkali mě, já jsem si nikdy nevšiml, jak ten plot je vysoký. But the point of the whole story, or the moral is, uh, all of these neighbors and people were standing in front of their walls or fences, and they said, um, you know what, I've never realized how tall my fence was. A vlastně byli schopni svůj plot uvidět prostě až 500 km od svého domu. And it took 500 kilometers traveling or distance for them to see how tall the fences or the wall between them was. A spotkali se tam třeba lidi, kteří kolem, kteří se v životě skrz ten plot neviděli. And for example, uh, there were neighbors who met uh, and were able to see each other what wasn't the case in their own village because the fences were so tall. A pro mě prostě kdybych měla jednoznačně říct, co je pro mě jakoby přenosný muzeum, tak je to prostě pro mě člověk. So if I was to say to, to tell you what the portable museum means, means for me it is a it is a person it is a it is a human being. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so very much Katerina. Um I, before we open it to the floor I've got maybe one or two questions and I think also we can encourage kind of cross questions because maybe you've got questions uh, for each other. Maybe one question to start with is we've heard a lot about your practice in relation to uh, portable museums. I was wondering if you've got any unrealized uh, museums, uh, this whole idea of the imaginary museum, but also maybe the utopic museum, the unrealized museum. Pedro, do you want to start? I think that the issue with the unrealized things is that uh, they are um, it's all all ideas that are unrealized that are unrealized get to be realized in a future project in a but but in a different combination of elements. So uh, if a project doesn't ha uh, is not done yet, it's because it's expecting for a better moment to to for that idea to be implemented. Uh, how about you, Ralph? An unrealized museum? I, I have a critique about museums that might speak to the unrealized museum, and that is uh, a museum that, in fact, educates us in some relevant way, uh, rather than simply entertain us or make us feel somehow cultured without really understanding what culture is about or what role the art plays in organizing our sense of self. I'll use the word um, cognition, I mean the way we perceive the world uh, with outside of the biases that we have about what the world is and how we've been acculturated to perceive it. Uh, a museum that, uh, in a sense, m contributes to our maturing as human beings. Uh, that's the unrealized museum that can, in a sense, in our experience within that museum, uh, make us, uplift us cognitively, I mean, mature us cognitively that we, we become more lucid and introspective and intellectual or intelligent about our perception. And I think the point about the, the human being is a critical one within all of that. And I think also children are a critical point. A, a museum that recognizes the art of children as an uh, important uh, expression that is equal to that of the grown-up. And in fact, that's, uh, I've used that as a gathering point for parents who are much more uh, rigid and stubborn about their relationships with other people. But if you bring children's art together in a space, you'll find all these families come to look at their children's work. That's how you can get all the grown-ups into one space who may ordinarily not be there to simply exhibit their children's art. And they'll be there families meeting each other, talking about their children's art. 
uh, because we have these airplanes flying here over <laughs> us nonstop, kind of thinking a lot about Cedric Price, the English visionary architect who was always saying that helicopter museums and other kinds of uh, transient uh, museums. Peter, do you have, I mean, Cedric I brings us I to I the Fan Palace. I am. A few years ago, I wanted to, to start um, uh, uh, captioning things instead of taking photographs. Um, but then I realized this was perhaps irresponsible, um, an irresponsible cluttering up the world, the world with more information. But yeah, uh, there were things that I, I would see something, um, you know, on a street corner um, or the side of a building or on the, you know, on a beach like here and see something interesting. And I, I thought it would be quite interesting to, to, to label that the, the way it would be labeled in, in, a, in a museum or in a, in a space. Um, but obviously, uh, as uh, Raphael was mentioning earlier, the, the um, Google Earth technology ad, uh, allows us to do that now without cluttering the world up with more pieces of, of paper. Um, so I think it's quite interesting, the idea of um, people being able to have a, a curatorial map uh, of places. Um, and obviously, you um, choose fairly carefully who you subscribe to. Um, but I think it would be quite interesting to, to just uh, draw people's attention to, um, to things that, that, um, that you observe and that you find interesting. And, and I think it's quite feasible to, to do that now. Katarina, do you have unrealized museums? Uh, tak pro mě uh, je určitě, já mám určitě velkou zkušenost s utopickými muzeama, protože jsem si jich v hlavě vystavila spoustu. Sure, I have a lot of experience with the unreal, unrealized museums because I have plenty of them in my head. A já jsem si postavila třeba vizi, že jeden den bude den otevřených dveří ve vesnici a všichni sousedi se navzájem navštíví. A vlastně to bylo úplně nerealizovatelné. Um, just to give an example of an unrealized museum in my head, I have a vision um, to kind of have an open house in my village where every single uh, person, every neighbor would go to each other's house, houses and visit them, visit each other. Jo, anebo jsem dělala projekt, který se jmenoval Někam se podívat, kdy jsem chtěla, aby se dvě vesnice navzájem prohodily a každá z nich si tu druhou prohlídla tak, aby ale v té vesnici nikdo nezůstal. Um, I had another project uh, where two, two villages, w one um, inhabitants of one village would go to another one in order in a way that nobody would stay in the other village so that they can see and have a look how people in the other village live. Ale oni měli strach, že se vzájemně něco ukradnou nebo že se prostě něco, že se tam ještě něco ztratí a vůbec to nechtěli realizovat. And nobody was uh, was willing to realize that because they were scared that they would steal something from their homes and uh, Takže pro mě tohle je prostě normální jako by utopický muzeum. So th this is for me a uh, utopist museum or, or unrealized museum. Come back to Pedro. When we met for the first time in Mexico, you did have your own museum, which was the Tower of the Winds. And I remember at that time we discussed a lot about artist museums and this idea. You mentioned Goritz also, so maybe it would be interesting to hear a little bit more about this idea from you about the artist museum. There is a, a, tra a tradition of of, uh, of of art museums or uh, done by artists in Mexico. I think that the interesting thing, for instance, in the case of Geritz was his idea of the experimental museum of El Eco, which was uh, 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 interesting in terms of how it was designed, because <coughs> you often approach architecture design drawing, and instead of that, he would do a, 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 s a short story, like, a, like more, more approaching from literature. So he would imagine, for instance, okay, I picture the entrance of this museum as a very, very long corridor. And this long corridor, the, the walls are getting more and more close, more narrow, so the co and, 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 the, the, and the floor is coming down. So what used to be a big entrance ends up as a, as a, as a it starts to become more narrow and narrow, and then you find a huge hall and that huge hall leads to a patio. So he, they were saying, well, okay, well, this can be translated into some kind of emotion or, 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 or action. So uh, El Eco had to do with the idea that this corridor was like the throat from where you had to prepare uh, uh, some kind of scream. So arriving to this big hall was the scream, and then the, uh, the patio was the echo of the scream. And uh, 
this was the way that Barragan and Geritz mm -hmm. often designed the buildings. First, it had to work as a story. And then, just after th that was uh, working as a, as a narrative, they would go on and do drawings. And, uh, and uh, uh, it was a response, uh, a kind of reaction against the idea of form follows function uh, with the manifesto of emotional architecture that Geritz did, where he was interested in how form followed emotion and uh, how these uh, different kind of spaces could translate different kind of moods or, or uh, uh, mind states. And in that way, it's interesting, the, the idea of experimentation on the space, where the museum itself was a work of art. <coughs> and that also leads us back to uh, Rafael's museum, because I was wondering um, when, I mean, Pedro mentioned uh, Goethe at the moment of the invention of the, the wind tower, the Torre de los Vientos. I was wondering, Rafael, when you invented your artist around museum, if you had any kind of models from the past, toolboxes which inspired you? The uh, institutions that had been created already uh, by the uh, dominant culture uh, in society, the museums of natural history, the fine arts museums, museums like the Met, that's why I used the models of the Museum of Natural History and all of its uh, idea of accumulating culture uh, and the Metro Metropolitan Museum and the Whitney and the MoMA, th they became the models for me uh, that in a sense uh, can be organized to then uh, give integrity to the uh, Puerto Rican culture, the, the Latino culture. Uh, so those were the models. There, there were an in a sense, any other model for me would have been uh, primitive. And uh, I, I was looking for those most successful uh, that had, uh, in a sense, acquired a cultural power within the society. And I was looking to recreate that power uh, within the uh, Puerto Rican and Barrio and the Latino culture. Uh, before we open it to the floor for all your questions, are there any questions? From the panelists, or <laughs> if not, we can open it now. We've got, I think, another quarter of an hour. So, if you've got any questions, I see a question here. I'm not sure if it was in Tom Lawson's last exit painting or somewhere I heard it that postmodernism was described as art that looks better photographed than it does in person. Um, with that in mind, or uh, whether that's true or not, um, do you think that the concept of the simulation of the museum, of the artworks in a museum, um, will change the form or uh, of the artwork itself? And if so, will um, that would an artwork that would lend itself well to simulation as opposed to something that wouldn't? And if if that's true, is there something? to be lost uh, as well as gained in that process? Uh, I think to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, well, I think that same problem occurred in the cave when uh, they went from just simply throwing uh, mineral pigments onto these handprints and then using tubes. And I could see the artists looking at each other saying, well, you know, there goes art. Okay. Uh, and then the, uh, the paintbrush and the weaving of fabric together and imagine all these radical changes. I mean, a pencil, right? And uh, manufactured pigments just walk into the store. And I mean, all of these things obviously removed us from art, right? But I think what, what's important is to understand that most of us cognitively are way behind what our potential is and what we see happening out there, let's say certainly in science. In other words, they're, they're sort of fanatically reaching for Mars, right? You understand? But, but we're very comfortable here in our space with all of our habits. And to the extent that we engage uh, this new technology, this tube that we blow you know, mineral pigment through and make the handprint, to the extent that we engage that and move our consciousness. I mean, we see children, they sit down on computers and in a couple of years, uh, there's no phobia, there's no resistance. 
they become really fluent. In other words, to what extent then, as we engage that process, moving from the object to that virtual reality, to the extent that finally we let go of the object, and it'll be transitional, it may take another 50 years, but it will happen, so that you're absolutely correct, it will transform the whole notion of what the art is and our experience with it. There's a question here. Have access to. Well, I think we've got a. They seem like two different things. Yeah, I, but I think we've got a lot of things to keep our hands dirty with. I, you know, I do some gardening, but I, so. Uh, I, what I'm saying is that um, the whole relationship that to the notion of artist as we understand ourselves as artists and the notion of the making something, I mean, because I spent a lot of time unmaking things as the art process. So there, there are a lot of conceptual frameworks within which we operate, which we've been acculturated to, to through the kind of education we've had as artists. So it's, it's not about I mean, you'll get up in the morning and, and you'll, you'll dress. Uh, eventually, perhaps at some point, we'll simply just have the thought and we'll be dressed. But, uh, you know, I mean, right now people go in and they clap their hands and the lights go on and or you whistle and, you know, they go off and so on. I mean, there are all of these kinds of changes that will modify our relationship to the notion of artist and the notion of our relationship to objects because the whole issue of objects and possession are all, there are all sorts of cultural uh, issues, political issues around the notion of object and possession. Okay, so I'm just saying that that, uh, that will, will whittle away that relationship as we engage the present of, of the techno technological tools that are available to the artist and which include a, a change conceptually of our, our whole cognitive relationship to artist and art. Thank you. There's a question here in the first row, if we might have, uh, and there's a question here also. It's a rendezvous of question marks. Good morning. Uh, well, I'm a founder of a museum in Venezuela, in a small town. Uh, this is my small contribution to make this world better, and it's been for 20 years already. Uh, we have an uh, educational program called El Museo y la Escuela, and we bring like 80 children every day to see the exhibitions. And it's very difficult to keep it going. We have uh, now a very vanguardist exhibition <coughs> called El Cuerpo Maquinico, about the relationship between the, the man and machines. And what should I do if the new museum is in an iPhone? What advice will you give me to this institution if I should keep going? Because every day I wake up and I don't know what to do to keep it going. <laughs> Finances, new ideas, new exhibition, attract good curators, all that. So I need your advice how to, what to do with this because it will save me a lot of time <laughs> and resources. Thank you. I, I would say um, make uh, develop really close friendships with the politicians. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's what's uh, contributed much to uh, protecting and, and contributing to the ongoing development and uh, evolving maturing of the Museo del Barrio. You need that kind of support from, from the state, from the government. It's, it's critical. Uh, some private foundations will fund you as long as you exhibit what they would enjoy as art, right, which limits uh, a lot of the freedom that you would have, and perhaps even limit what you bring into the schools. Okay, it's, it's, it gets really complicated once you get out into the world of finance and politics, but that's where you need to go. And, and, and somebody has to um, 
somebody has to curate and somebody has to edit. I mean, the, the, the more and more information there is out there, the more we are dependent on um, people who are able to edit that for us, people whose um, uh, opinions and judgments w we, we trust. We, we, need, um, we need filters to, um, to be able to, to get the best out of what there is there to, to find out. So I, I think that it's always going to be important. And the more information, the more necessary it is to find a way to, to filter it. Um, the, the remarkable thing about the about media is is its ability to to uh, to dis disseminate um, uh, kind of in a way um, enlightenment and education to, to people and for to find out about things um, the, the the downside of of art I in media is that the the loss of experience of the real thing and the but the positive side is is so many m more hundreds of thousands of people actually engaging with 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 visual culture and, and, and with art is quite astonishing. Um, Katerina was mentioning the, the UK of mentioning the Tate Gallery. Well, uh, even 10 years ago, it was not like that at the, at the Tate in, in London. The, there were not um, hundreds of families there at the weekend looking at things. Um, the, the, the speed of, of change of the relationship to contemporary art in the UK has been really quite astonishing. Um, and and media now um, disseminates so much information about art so th this is is uh, positive there's something always is lost but um, i think also something very important is gained i think that also something that it's important is to uh, acknowledge that the most important asset of a museum is not the building is not the artwork is not their collection it's their ideas <coughs> and uh so that's why uh, also it's the role of the curator is so extremely important, which paradoxically is some of the worst paid jobs in the business. <laughs> but, you know, like uh, often, you know, like uh, uh, sometimes in Mexico we say that there's two kinds of museums, the ones that give you nothing and the ones that you have to, to put yourself. <laughs> But uh, uh, all museums are struggling with shortage of, 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 of budget. And never, nevertheless, I don't think that, they, that that's, that should be the reason why you have a better or worse program. The, there are museums which are extremely well funded, which have very, very impressive collections and very impressive museums. And still, they are not the most interesting. Actually, Sometimes uh, a small institution is more f uh, has more potential to innovate than a large one, and uh, and I really think that what the focus should be is on the production of the ideas, and if you get the right curator, you'll get the right art, and then uh, in the right combination also. Uh, so I really think that that the, the curator is a crucial crucial element. In, 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 if, uh, in deciding if an institution is, is worth uh, visiting or not. Because in the end, the museum is a place where you find inspiration, no? It comes from muse. So the inspiration, this is something interesting. Uh, 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 the first, uh, the first uh, uh, description of what inspiration is it's uh, in a dialogue by Plato, where uh, Socrates is talking to a prosodian that is called Ion. And they describe what is inspiration. Well, they actually describe this as a kind of physical element. And they say, have you seen those rocks that have magnetic powers? You know, like they, they're talking about a magnet, natural magnet. And they said, like, if you have different links, you know, like different, like uh, rings of metal, they you can connect and make like a kind of chain without these rings being intersected. You know, like they just hang on to each other by some kind of invisible force. They say, inspiration is like this. It's something that connects things before, be, be, uh, without having to have them, uh, you know, like a, yes. But they are connected by an invisible force. And that's what inspiration is. Katerina? Uh, 
Já, si mysl, já teďka pominu finance a pominu jakoby třeba kurátory. Já se teďka zaměřím na to, že si myslím, že z pohledu mojí země se dá za hodně málo peněz dělat obrovské věci. From the country where I come from, we were able to create a lot for very little money. Já si myslím, že tady je spíš důležitý to uh, získat prostě, uh, aby to zajímalo lidi, kteří to prostě teďka v této době vůbec nezajímá. Um, I think it's very important to get people who are absolutely not interested in in, in your in your project or your museum to get them to get interested in it. A vlastně jakoby ta role muzea může, může být i ta, že se prostě na půl roku zakáže tam lidem prostě chodit. Protože lidi většinou zajímá to, co je zakázaný. A prostě já si myslím, že, že uh, ten okamžik prostě překvapení může být úplně banální a levný, ale prostě musí být pro ty lidi nějaký, jak to, že mi někdo něco třeba zakazuje. Where it's just a moment of surprise that something is forbidden and they can't go there. It's very uh, banal and very cheap, but might bring a lot of business or might, you know, bring people to see and come to a museum. A taky taky je důležitý to vlastně jakou roli to muzeum v těch jednotlivých projektech hraje, protože ta jeho role se může uh, úplně proměňovat. Uh, and also you have to you have to realize that and or it has to be clear to you what what role does your museum play in in that particular community or, or place where it is. My máme pořád představu, že muzeum někomu něco nabízí a někomu něco ukazuje, ale ta role může být úplně opačná. Uh, because we understand or we believe that museum is is a, is a building or a project or something that is trying to show us something, but it may be the other way around. To znamená, že by klidně i mě mohlo být otevřený způsobem, že ty lidi si tam ukazují, co chtějí oni, i když my můžeme říkat, že to jsou úplné blbosti. A zároveň to muzeum nemusí být vůbec ani jakoby iniciátorem. To muzeum klidně může být jenom jakože nějakou akci, třeba je v, té, v tom muzeu reklama na tu akci, která se odehrává úplně někde jinde, ale ty lidi to v tom muzeu uvidí. For example, your museum doesn't even have to be the, the leader or the initiator of the idea. It can be just the mean for people to come and um, And, and use your, use your building. Já bych ještě zareagovala na ten objekt, jak se tady jakoby řešilo. Já si myslím, že lidi, i když je, žijeme jako už ve virtualitě, takže lidi prostě potřebují něco držet. Je to prostě jako důležitá věc. I just also wanted to mention when we were talking about the object, how uh, some, we are trying to get away from objects and trying to touch them, you know, our everyday objects. It's, uh, um, je to prostě krásná utopie, ale lidi potřebují něco držet. It's a very utopistic idea, but we, we need to touch and feel prostě i když, for us to express ourselves. I když prostě lidi přemluvím, aby celý den dělali to tež, oni si prostě potřebují odnést aspoň společnou věc z toho nákupu, třeba i gelitovou tašku. Uh, for example, even if I'm trying to persuade people to do something together, in their heads they need to be able to get and touch and bring something from that project, even though it's a, it's a plastic bag from... Je to, prostě, je, to, je to smutný, ale je to prostě tak. We may have the microphone. It's arriving. It's arriving on the move. Uh, my only question is, uh, having in mind that uh, art is a reflection of the life, um, can artwork be virtual? I can't believe in a tiny miracle, but still kind of material. And then, um, yes. just um, the question is, can life be virtual? Meaning can, that can art is virtual. Well, the question simply is, can life be virtual? Can life be virtual? Yeah, yes. because it's... Uh, well, it is virtual. It's virtual. You, the notion of reality. Microphone. Uh, maybe my 
human uh, life. Li life, yes, life, human life is virtual. Uh, if, if you can recall all of the dreams you've had, four to six a night, every day of your life, if you can recall all of that, if you can put all that time together, that clearly is a virtual part of your life. All of your imagining, all of your daydreams, if you could put all of them together, all of that time together, that's your virtual life. So we have a virtual life, and, and yet it, it interfaces with what we consider actuality. The idea of touching things, the idea of, of tasting things, smelling things, hearing things. But then what is hallucination? What is madness? To what extent is our sense of who we are, I am, within our experience? And that could be the virtual side of our lives. The question is, to what extent we give integrity to it, we integrate it into our day-to-day -day process of being. That's the issue. How do you approach the idea of virtual human being? Virtual human being? Uh, you're talking about a real future. Yes, I mean, you could start with the hologram, the holographic projection of an individual, the ghost, if you like. You know, to what extent that becomes a reality for a lot of people as the person. I think that it has to do a little bit with the idea that often we discuss art as if it was hardware, where most of the time is software. Uh, it's like a metaphor, but if you say, well, obviously you can have, let's say, a Caesar salad, that is like a dish with a lettuce and all that, but the, it's also, you know, like a, you can have the recipe for the Caesar salad. So w it's like a partiture and a mu piece of music. So it art is uh, transmitted th 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 and reproduced many times, although often there's like a kind of uh, obsession with the ob actual object, no? But uh, recently, ectachrome film, like two months ago, stopped being produced, which means that soon there won't be slides anymore. Basically, if you can buy a roll of ectachrome film, it's about the last ones that are available in the market. And now all photographs, at least the ones that are, that are where slides, you know, like where you could see through the film, uh, will be information. So all the images are information, and if your hard drive uh, fails out of the desk, the, 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 the from virtual uh, goes into nothingness. Yes, uh, I have a reflection to share with you. Um, in 1989, I was um, studying art, and I was part of the program, educational program of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Caracas. And um, for some reason, I started to see that we had no public, not, not visitors. And I was questioning myself about the cognitive learning I was thinking on the role of uh, mm -hmm. the education in the mm -hmm. museum and schools, and um, how overpopulated was Caracas at that time. Right now, it's way worse. And uh, they had no sense of uh, uh, spending time in the museums. So, um, well, I came to with this idea of getting the floor plan from uh, uh, the architecture department of the museum and I, uh, from AutoCAD, I built the entire museum but virtually. And then I said, well, uh, what is the best way to uh, learn and, and enjoy your time and have fun and invite people and gather and talk? Well, that's the only thing I do at home. So, because uh, if I go to school, uh, I'll be directed to learn certain particular books. But at home, I have the choice of uh, buying and reading and watching whatever movie I want and, and putting the photos or the paintings or whatever artwork I like. So I, I thought that the best way would be like a, in the same building, a virtual uh, museum was built. So I, I made it as a virtual rental community 
and through emails you can actually connect to everybody and and have your own um, a full experience of uh, something you cannot actually get in the real museum. So I would like to address this to you in that sense of um, the virtual museum as an experience of um, adding something to the real uh, one. I mean, my, my own experience is that the most um, the most vital part of learning I is actually when you want to learn. There's the whole academic process that we go through as, as, as young people, which is um, necessary. But learning really begins at the point at which you want to learn. And, um, you know, situations around the world are all entirely relative to one another. Nobody's situation is the same as somebody else's. Um, and the, um, the important thing is to find those accessible entry points. And, and that requires um, kind of wit and intelligence and um, a sympathetic attitude to find the entry points for people. Um, and those entry points are relative as well. And, and um, it, it's necessary for that level of engagement. And you know, whether, it's, um, you know, whether it's academic or whether it's purely pop, at whatever level it's pitched, it doesn't matter as long as it's effective. And, and you find the entry point into which people then go in and then find that they, they want to learn things. And whatever method is, is necessary for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, with regard to the, the virtual comment from earlier, I mean, we, we, um, um, w we evolve in sync with our technology. And, and technology brings us new experiences. And we have responses to those new experiences. I, I, I don't think that anything Anything eliminates what came before, but it becomes a, a new dimension that, that we work with. I'd, I'd, I'd like to respond uh, to the idea of, of learning. Uh, you can't help but learn. I mean, learn is, is a part of the kind of bio system structure, bio brain structure that is ours. You, the question is, if you're teaching yourself for instance, is an example not to read. You're actually teaching yourself not to read. It's not that you haven't learned to read. The question now is how do you deconstruct the having learned not to read? Then you can move the learning into a different context. So learning is, is inevitable. It, you can learn to be a very, uh, to be a criminal, and, and the question is to deconstruct that and learn to be a more civil, less sociopathic individual. And when you talk about education, I mean, the virtualness is very important. How many w of you watch soap operas? Now, there's a virtual reality you're all linked to, and you talk about these characters as if they really exist. <coughs> and you often organize a lot of your problem solving around their problem solving. And there's an entire virtual world that millions and billions of people are living every day. So it's not, it's not some radical notion. The question is what, and I think that's the critical thing, and I think you made that point, what do you want, to, what do you want people to learn? Okay, what do you want them to learn? Katerina? A já si myslím, že v podstatě trochu jakoby vzniká nový umělecký obor, jak přitáhnout lidi, kteří tam nechtějí chodit do galerie. I'm almost under the impression that a new uh, field of art has been created or, or is being created how to attract people to come to see something they never actually wanted to see. Protože mám pocit, že už to nezvládají ani kurátoři, ani novináři, ani galeristi. Because I, I have a feeling that um, galleries, curators or, or media are failing to attract people to come to the museum. Protože to, to je pořád stejná, furt dokola stejná skupina lidí. Because it's, it's actually over and over again the same group of people. A já, abych prostě dostala třeba lidi, kteří to vůbec nezajímá do té galerie, tak musím najít úplně nový důvod. A může to být i třeba ten, že tam najdou svou bývalou lásku. Uh, for example, for me to attract people to come to the museum and see the art is to, to create a totally brand new idea of how to do that. For example, uh, maybe for them to come and, and, and meet their old uh, flame, their, their old love. 
je, je to prostě úplně jako bláznivý, ale já prostě třeba nemám vůbec jiný nápad, jak tam tyhle ty lidi dostat. Já tam vždycky dostanu na základě toho, že se buď té akce zúčastní, to znamená, že mají sami nějaký jako chtíč, anebo je tam na něco nalákám. Um. I, I, and I always fail to attract and to bring people there and what always works and it may sound crazy to you what always works is those people have to be a part of the project they have to participate in some way or the other or um, I have to lurk them on, on some premises or, or something for them a they, they have to have the idea or the understanding there's something waiting for them there a z mých zkušeností je to tak že jestliže ten okamžik je silný tak oni potom příště do toho muzadu znova And I ha- and from my exper- speaking from my experience, if the memory of it or the or the experience is strong enough, they will come again. Ale, ale ten, ten důvod je většinou úplně jiný než vizuální umění. But, but the reason for it, it, it's always very different than the visual uh, museum, and it's always always different and different and um, other. It's always a, the other um, reason. I I, I just a moment. I and I'll take care of the question. That can I, can, yes, I, I just want to say that there are, for instance, uh, there is a museum uh, in, in, uh, in Europe, uh, just outside of Cologne, where people are paid to attend. And, and they have no problems with attendance. <laughs> Peter, you wanted to say I just, I mean, it's interesting what Katerina said. I, I mean, it, 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 the, the situation in Britain is, is really quite, different this last, as I said, 10 years. Um, art, uh, contemporary art, has become like a pop issue in Britain. And uh, people are beginning to engage with it now the same way they invo- engage with pop music and then they engage with fashion. And they're increasing, increasingly engaging uh, with art and attempting to engage with art. Um, and um, I think that's fine. <laughs> I, I just think wh- whatever way it happens uh, is, is okay as long as it happens. Um, and it's a, um, a, a learning curve. Um, I mean, this, this fair in Miami this week is, 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 is a pop event, uh, and um, gradually art and society come closer together, for better or worse. That could be a mo- wonderful conclusion. Thank you all very much. Many, many thanks. <laughs>